I will not be silenced, and I will not let you distort my words. I can't believe I have to say this, but P Palestinian people are not disposable. We are human beings, just like anyone else. The cries of the Palestinian and, ch Palestinian and Israeli children sound no different to me. Why, what I don't understand is why the cries of Palestinians sound different to you all. Last night, 22 House Democrats joined with the Republican majority to censure the only Palestinian American in Congress, Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. The resolution accused the congressman of, quote, promoting false narratives regarding the October 7th, 2023 Hamas attack on Israel and for calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. The congresswoman denies these accusations. The resolution also objects to a passage in a video she released earlier this month that calls on President Joe Biden to support a ceasefire in Gaza, specifically a segment of that video that depicted protesters in Tlaib's home state of Michigan chanting the phrase you see there, from the river to the sea. Now, the resolution called that chant, which is commonly used by some pro-Palestinian activists, quote, a genocidal call to violence to destroy the state of Israel and its people and to replace it with a Palestinian state extending from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. In a statement, Congresswoman Tlaib rejected that characterization, instead calling it, quote, an aspirational call for freedom, human rights and peaceful coexistence, not death, destruction or hate. And Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib joins me now. Congresswoman, thank you for coming on tonight. I just want to start by asking what your conversations with your Democratic colleagues have been like over the last 24 hours, particularly if you've talked to any of the 22 that voted for the censure resolution. I mean, many of my colleagues know I, uh, I have an open door policy. They can come and talk to me about this and they know uh, the conversation will lead and me urging them to please save as many lives as possible, and that means calling for a ceasefire. Uh, again, my colleagues know where my heart is, and they know that I have been pushing from day one of coexistence, of the days where my, both my grandparents, when they were born there, that there was coexistence among all faiths, uh, living in peace. Uh, and, you know, much of what I'm seeing is distortion, distortion of my words, also in trying to silence my residents who have been calling from the beginning of freedom, freedom from inequality, freedom from the occupation, freedom from the violence. And so it has been really difficult, I think, for me as I walk on the House floor, walking there, watching many of the colleagues that voted for this not engage me. And they know I'm ready. I'm ready to have those conversations. And I think they're missing an opportunity to talk to a Palestinian a Palestinian American serving with them. I have a lived experience that needs to be shared and be heard. I want to sort of stipulate here that I don't, I think the central resolution is a sort of ludicrous distraction amidst the, the sheer amount of human suffering happening in the region. Uh, so, you know, the, just to put that aside, it, 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 but I do want to talk about this phrase because obviously this was a phrase that I think really um, caught some folks, I think, Jewish Americans, supporters of Israel, different folks, and, and it reads differently to different people from the river to the sea. Um, the contention is that this, this is a call for a kind of anti-colonial expulsion, right? Similar to like mm -hmm. Algeria kicking out the French, right? Like get out of here, go back to wherever you came from. This is the, how it's heard, I think, to a lot of Jewish ears. And so I want you to explain like what you mean by it and why you used it or why you included it in the video. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm asking my colleagues, don't distort the words of my residents. Many people in this movement for human rights for Palestinians have always centered it around coexistence. Uh, you hear them calling for that uh, and saying that, you know, no matter your faith, your ethnicity, your background, you should be able to live uh, without fear, without discrimination, without this kind of inequality that, you know, Netanyahu's extremist party and his leadership has been pushing. And so for many of my colleagues, they know uh, and deep in their hearts where my heart is and many of the folks, including the American Jewish community that's out there, demanding again the, the call again uh, against this, this notion that we can't all live together. And so uh, I, I think 
again, this is just a moment right now that folks want to use the specific moment to silence the majority of Americans that are calling for a ceasefire, to silence this movement around actual peaceful coexistence. Because right now, that's not what Netanyahu wants. Netanyahu's current government, most extremist government in the history of Israel, is not calling for that. He's going to the United Nations and basically showing maps where Palestinians don't exist. And so I wish my colleagues will call out that. I, just to be clear here, I mean, what, when you talk about peaceful coexistence, you imagine a, a pluralistic democratic state in the full land from the river to the sea. It was people call it the one state solution. But that would be, I mean, fundamentally, the people that adhere to Zionism and think Israel should exist as a Jewish state, like, they're just not going to like that. I'm not, I just want to clarify what the actual oh, positions are. I understand are. that. And, you know, Chris, look, I grew up in the most beautiful, blackest city in the country where separate but equal didn't work. We saw it in our own country. But I'm not going to push it on the people. If folks want to push for a two-state, go for it. But guess what? Guess what? Netanyahu's current government is not supporting that. He's literally said it to us over and over again. He doesn't want to coexist with Palestinians. And we're saying, no, we're going to have a peaceful, a peaceful coexistence and pushing against uh, those that want to target people solely based on the fact they're Palestinian or of a different faith. And again, that's what my city that I grew up in taught me mm. is to push against that kind of racism, that kind of discrimination and that kind of, again, call for elimination. If I'll use the words he said, cleanse Gaza. Uh, you know, this is what I have to continue to speak truth to power on. And I'm not going to allow I'm not going to allow folks to distort or try to silence or, again, try to uh, make out that my residents are calling for something, anything, anything but the end to the violence. You have uh, worked assiduously on behalf of, obviously, you represent a community that has a lot of folks that are uh, from the Middle East, and particularly Palestinian. You've worked assiduously on behalf of, I believe, two residents who were American residents who were trapped in Gaza. Um, I, I read an account today that talked about how much your efforts were um, instrumental in bringing them home uh, out of Gaza. Can you tell me a little bit about what that experience was like trying to get to Americans uh, to, to safety here back in the U.S.? I mean, Zechariah and Layla are finally home, back home safely in Michigan, but it was an awful, horrific experience. Uh, they're Americans. And what I saw from the State Department and Secretary Blinken's uh, leadership is every single day that myself and many of my colleagues were asking, what is the plan to get Americans out of Gaza? There was no plan for days. And to me, that put the lives of Americans uh, at risk. And what I heard from Zakaria, who was sheltering after his, his family's home was bombed, was sheltered in a hospital with his wife, is that he said it smelled like death, that every single day he was worried that his life was going to be taken. He would leave me voice text, Chris, uh, just begging, uh, urging, please tell them to get us out of here. Please tell them to stop. Everything he saw was women and children coming into that hospital. They didn't have food. They didn't have electricity. He just had run out of his medication literally a few days before he was evacuated. And, you know, he just was in despair. I cannot express to you enough uh, how hard it is uh, as a member of Congress asking, again, our government to please, please uh, help save the lives of Americans, get them out. And again, they didn't move with the urgency that I was hoping, but he's home. But one of the things you should know, Chris, is the overwhelming guilt that he's home safe and his family is still in Gaza right now uh, being bombarded. And every day he worries that they're not going to be able uh, to live through this. Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, the lone Palestinian American member of Congress representing the city of Detroit. Thank you so much for making time for us tonight. Thank you. What you've just seen uh, came out not too long ago on November 8th, 2023. Um, the description reads, Congresswoman, Congresswoman Rashidia Talalib. Oh man, I have never been able to pronounce her name, but she's the Palestinian American Congresswoman. Okay. Um, I've probably had quite a bit of critical support for her, I guess. I, I'm not for the existence of the United States. In fact, that's largely how Bundism in the United States is looking. You know, it, 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 not, not the social democratic wannabes, but like, 
Buddhism within the United States is just as much against Zionism and Americanism. A lot of that has to do with if you if you understand the real description of a Noahide according to Judaism, mo most Native Americans and First Nations peoples would fit the category. But that's not the real the only reason why. I mean, decolonization is a must. Not just not just the decolonization of Israel to to bring back Palestine or the decolonization of the United States to bring back the the, the tribes, but also the many different layers of colonialism. Um, ultimately, the United States of America, the state of Israel, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada don't have a right to exist. And neither does the United Kingdom. Um, free Ireland, long live the Irish Republican Army. You know, the Welsh and the Scottish should wake up and demand independence from the English, and really only the English poor people should restructure England or or, or remove it, because, like, who cares about England as a nation-state, honestly? Um, that's not nothing against an English people, but, like, the, 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 the truth is it's time for reparations on all these ends. And you know something? Most Native Americans do not want to expel people. It's just a fact. They just want the sovereignty back, and I agree with them. Now, that's another word that is in dispute typically amongst certain Buddhists. For instance, when Dr. Weisfeld speaks of sovereignty, he typically refers to the state. I do not agree with his, with his usage of the term sovereignty, and he definitely does not agree with mine. Of course, we both ha would have the same outlook about the problem with the state. I I'd say that me and him are not in dispute with each other about the problem of the state. I think the question would be is what is sovereignty, and I would definitely disagree with his take. And he would definitely disagree with mine. There's a lot of nuance that can exist in this. I'm very critical of feminism, given its colonial origins, and I do not apologize for saying that. But at the same time, several Buddhists will undoubtedly be, be feminists, and that's just a given. Um, there's so much I do plan to get into the nuances of and the differences and the different um, points of view within the Bund today. But one thing that is definitely the case, Americanism and Zionism are both seen as in, as, as in opposition to the freedom of Jewish people to live Jewishly. So there were some inappropriate comments that had to be removed from a previous video, but it's, it's, it's baffling that people don't realize that Dr. Weisfeld, the guy that you saw in both, uh, in the last four videos, uh, Education Palestine, Part one of one, Education Palestine part, sorry, Education Palestine part one of two, Education Palestine part two of two, and then you have Not in Our Name part one of two, and Not in Our Name part two of two. All of those videos, they featured Dr. Weisfeld, who is recognized as Palestinian, according to several people, uh, Palestinians within Nablus. And I should point something else out here. Um, Palestinians are indigenous to that area, not the Israelis. The Palestinians, um, their their lineage actually is that they are most of them basically are Israelites that converted to Judaism. Not that basically Israelites that converted not you know to Judaism because they had to had Judaism, but they converted to Christianity and later many of them to Islam. And then there's also the different people that you know came over throughout the period. Uh, so. For instance, if you were to pick apart Palestinian DNA, you would, you would find Roman descent, but you would also find uh, descent from the House of Judah. Like, for real. In fact, Ashkenazi DNA and Palestinian DNA bore almost no differences when you look at it. In fact, it would be Sephardi DNA that would be more alien to Palestinian DNA. Not as much with Mizrahim, or Mizrahim would, would definitely have a distinct DNA to Palestinians, but they would have more in common with Palestinians than Sephardim. That gets into a whole nother thing. Um, but for, from the river to the sea, I've been saying that forever. This criminalizing of Palestinian liberation in the discourse is a criminalization of Jewish people finally being able to speak for ourselves, which just isn't allowed. The most you get is like Jewish Learning Institute, which you can tell is cryptically telling you to be a Zionist because Chabad Lubavitch invested too much in the state of Israel, and they're not the leaders of our generation. They definitely don't have the Mazora. If you believe that 
there is a mazora that guides the Jewish people. Only Nitzri Karta could qualify for that. There are a lot of problems with Chabad. In fact, Chabad, um, after its third Rebbe, it had a, it had a several schisms, and what we understand is Lubavitch is only one branch of that. The funny thing is, is that um, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe was extremely anti-Zionist. Then the sixth one um, didn't really care either way from the way it looked, and then the and then the seventh one denied being a Zionist the whole time for the most part, but was in bed with politicians such as Benjamin Netanyahu beforehand. So another thing to point out is the state of Israel is not running on ultra-Orthodox Jewish policies. There is a there is basically an alliance with Chabad and the Likud party. And this is this is what Zionism is. This is what a Zionism inevitably leads to. So no one is happy that hostages were taken. However, it is not true that the Muslim Brotherhood had beheaded babies. None of that happened. They took hostages. And some of those hostages have been recovered, actually. And on top of it, it, Hamas hasn't killed a single hostage. But the state of Israel has it in law that they can bomb, carpet bomb Gaza, including the Israelis in Gaza. And different people coming from other countries within Gaza. So, really, the whole question to me is, do you support ceasefire? Um, if Jewish people in this country are for ceasefire, I'm not going to get in their way with that. Um, my the priority I see is that the state of Israel should just not exist. The state of Israel ceasing to exist will lead to a further acceptance of land back within the United States and Canada, and the sooner the better. Because one thing that you'll like I said, if you actually got to know the the indigenous, the natives, that most of them do not want to push off Europeans or some shit like that. They just want the sovereignty back, and I'm okay with that because the United States of America is a tyranny. It's time to stop acting like it's anything but a white supremacist government which adopts different people of color to be just as white as the white people. Whiteness was largely, you know, as a concept, it was largely created during the Inquisition. So as a Sephardi, I have a personal look at this. Uh, I do have a personal outlook about this that, you know, is not unheard of. Unfortunately, out of the Ashkenazi, Mizrahim, and Sephardi, most of this Sephardim, we are the, typically the most uh, the most assimilated, actually, and the most lost. But those of us who are not assimilated are usually somewhat semi-integrated, and we tend to hold on to a lot of Al-Andalusian culture. This definitely does explain me. And Dr. Abram Weisfeld, who I keep featuring because he was the chairman of the Jewish Bundist Diaspora Movement, and he still operates as the chairman um, in different respects as well, he went to Palestine several times. They shot this man's been shot by a rubber bullet, which if you know anything about those rubber bullets, or they're not they're they're basically metal covered in plastic. You know, um I have been you know, for ten years straight I did a hard seasoned activism, which took much of my life uh, <laughs> from me. And, you know, there was always Dr. Weisfeld who everybody took the cues from. He became the example. He went into the West Bank, lived among them, and if you find, and, and, and now a lot of young people are attracted to doing the same thing. That is why he had been arrested for cr criminal mischief, that is why he's going through all these legal issues, and that's because the Boond is back. So this whole thing was like, oh, the Boond was stupid and they died. No, you know, the Boond was still popular, you know, after the Holocaust. The problem was, is that after the Holocaust... There was so much backing for the Zionists, not just by capitalists, but even by the communists. Um, and, and no, I'm not going into some crazy thing about ex exaggerating who Stalin got rid of or whatever, because the idea that the the idea that the Soviet Union did more harm to Jewish people or to anybody more harm than Nazi Germany, you're scum if you actually think that. But anyway, um, this. Um, this uh, next clip I have is from uh, Naturia Carta. I uh, I feel like I feel like there's better ways I can convey this, and I'm working on that too. But you know, the the last four document, like basically, uh, you know, make, remix documentaries, were done for the sake of you know basically a crash course uh, into into the problem at hand. Uh, as, as it is. So this, let me pull them up. This next one is a video of Rabbi David Feldman uh, from Naturi Karta International speaking at a pro-Palestinian rally 
in Newburgh, New York on November 7th of this year of 2023. Thank you, Brother Ali. I thank the organizers. And I thank the previous speakers, the sister that told those personal stories. So right, we all have to listen to these stories. And we have to open our eyes to what is happening. I appreciate the words of the brother before that explained that we don't have to be Palestinian in order to speak up to what is happening. Let me tell you, I'm a Jewish rabbi. I have many colleagues who are indigenous Palestinians. My colleague on the very far right is eight, eight generation Palestinian and many like him. And we have so many Jewish people the world over who are embarrassed by all what is taking place or pain by what is being done supposedly in our name. This is a true genocide, what we are experiencing in front of our eyes, where we have a mass murder, killing, murdering innocent men, women and children. This is not acceptable in any way. We as Jewish people, as I said, we are embarrassed that all of this is being done supposedly in our name. But it's even way worse when our religion is sadly being misused to justify all these crimes forbidden in Judaism. This whole concept of Zionism, this existence of the state of Israel is in total contrast of basics of Jewish belief and certainly killing and stealing, oppressing an entire people. You don't have to be Jewish to realize and understand how wrong this is. But this is not only a crime in international law. This is a true violation of Judaism. We have to stop all of this. Certainly we need a ceasefire. Certainly this, what is taking, what is happening today for the past weeks is, has to stop. Unfortunately, we are witnessing a cycle of bloodshed, not only now, but this is a cycle of bloodshed affecting everyone involved already going on for over 75 years. The Secretary General of the United Nations just said the other day, what happened on October 7th, which was a tragedy, didn't happen out of a vacuum. This was a result, a sad result, a tragic result of an uh, ongoing occupation of over 75 years. No one condones violence. But unfortunately, what is going on is, is unfortunately causing what we are experiencing for the past so long, close to a century. In order to see a better future, if we are really concerned about the safety and security of all, yes, we need a ceasefire, but ceasefire is way not enough. A two-state solution is not a solution. That's right. That's right. We have to stop the entire occupation. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, God forbid, nobody chooses it and nobody appreciates it. Nobody is excited about what is happening. But unfortunately, we are witnessing a cycle of violence on all sides, and this should stop. God willing, we hope that this occupation stops in its entirety. We hope and we pray that this stops peaceful, with no more suffering of anyone. And at that time, we can hope to see once again that beautiful peace that did exist in Palestine before the 1920s, before the invention of Zionism. Once we, we can hope that this past history, thank you, thank you, this past history can be an example, can show us how the future is supposed to look like, how it should look like, and how God willing, inshallah, it will look like. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I think uh, this can this this should continue with um, the um, something which came out on November eighth, not too long ago, November eighth of this year of twenty twenty three. Um, this clip uh, was published on the Electronic Intifada channel. 
um, which I think is worth to give a little bit of context on the kind of propaganda or you know PR struggle that is going on. Um, the former Prime Minister of <coughs> of Israel, Naftali Bennett, who I'm sure, well, you all know who he is, and probably most of your listeners do as well, a particularly thuggish, uh, fascist um, political leader in Israel. Um, before he headed to New York and Washington um, two days ago, he tweeted um, in Hebrew on his uh, Twitter or X account. Um, this is, you know, from the auto translate. So maybe take the exact wording with a, with a pinch of salt. Um, but he says, tonight I'm going on a political information tour in New York and Washington. Our, inter and in our international situation is not good. My goal is to help the Israeli government strengthen our position in public opinion, in Congress and in the administration in order to give the IDF commanders full freedom of action to wipe out Hamas. World, opinion, world public opinion is not in our favour. For example, there are 15 times, exclamation mark, the number of views of pro-Palestinian slash Hamas content compared to pro-Israeli content on TikTok. I will work with all my might to change this and give the Israeli government a boost. Um, and so I think in a way that is encouraging um, and it shows that the fact that I think this we and, you know, we can discuss the, the Hamas's ISIS framing specifically. I think I think that worked or is working or did work on the people on kind of people that were already convinced. Um, I think initially when there was the initial blitz of you know really egregious atrocity propaganda in the first few days post October the 7th. I think it probably worked on a broader group of people then. Um, but I think what we have, you know, writing that article already feels like a lifetime ago. You know, it was two, yeah. two maybe three weeks ago and it, things have moved so far from then actually you know I have, i've not been keeping tabs on it kind of s that systematically but i think i think that the, the hamas is isis um justification has kind of almost dropped off a little bit and i think they're trying they're trying different things um because the savagery of the last few weeks i think i think in some ways they've almost stopped trying to justify in a, in a certain way it's like they're just doing it uh, obviously, they're concerned, hence why Naftali Bennett is, is going to the US in t specifically for those reasons. Um, but I don't think that the Hamas's ISIS framing is really working anymore beyond the people that would be inclined to believe it anyway. Mm -hmm. I do, having said that, there is a, you know, I, con I con constantly try to remind myself that, you know, largely the people that I interact with and follow you know we are we are in a bubble to some extent and i consciously try and step outside of that bubble and there is a a, a significant portion of you know islamophobic opinion that can be uh, tapped into to aid that um but you know in his opening remarks ali mentioned um that 80 percent of the u.s public um want to want to see 80 percent of republicans uh of, sorry 66 percent sorry 66 public, yeah sorry 80 percent of democrats and 57 percent of republicans which shocked me frankly yeah the, so a, a clear majority of republicans even wanted the ceasefire and this was you know before we'd even seen the worst of it yeah so the, the, the same is true in the UK. The most the most recent public opinion poll by YouGov that I've seen, I think, was from the 20th of October. So, you know, just absolutely unspeakable acts have been committed since then. And then it was, um, I think, 70, 76 percent of the of those polled, the UK public wanted a ceasefire. Uh, obviously, a ceasefire wanting a ceasefire, you know, a, a, a manifold of opinions can be contained within that. But I think the initial outrage that was generated you know very 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 deliberately with the atrocity propaganda um regarding the behead you know the supposed beheaded babies etc i think that did give i think israel could have got away with you know let's say a week of carnage uh from that 
but they've continued and they've gone to this kind of maximalist position of they're not going to stop. And I think it is very evident that that is causing them and the US consequently. And, you know, again, what you opened with Ali, the fact that the US is trying to imply they want to restrain Israel, but are helpless to do so. It, you know, obviously it's transparently absurd, but it's also them wanting to limit or attempt to mitigate the global, uh, you know, I think PR, using the word PR kind of ch cheapens the, the severity of what we're talking about to an extent, but, you know, it's a, it's a PR disaster um, and it's not going to be forgotten. And I think it's one of the ways in which I don't think it's, any exaggeration to say that October the 7th and, and what's happened over the last uh, almost you know a month tomorrow is really a complete historic watershed, um, not just for Palestine, but for the world. Um, and it's something, what happened on October 7th is from the perspective of the collective West, it's something that was not supposed to happen. And... Um... It, moving along, I think that what will bring this into an even fuller context will be uh, this next clip, which uh, was published on the Democracy Now! channel, published on, uh, on November 7th, 2023. This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. No ceasefire, no votes. And in November, we remember. Those were two chants we heard Saturday in Washington at the largest rally in U.S. history for Palestinian rights. Protesters denounced President Biden for refusing to support a ceasefire in Gaza while sending more arms to Israel as it continues its month-long bombardment that's killed over 10,000 Palestinians, including 4,000 children. Polls show Biden's support among Arab Americans is plummeting. This is Nahadawad, the head of CARE, that's the Council on American Islamic Relations, speaking at Saturday's rally. No ceasefire, no votes. No ceasefire, no votes. No votes in Michigan. No votes in Arizona. No votes in Georgia. No votes in Nevada. No votes in Wisconsin. No votes in Pennsylvania. No votes in Ohio. No votes for you anywhere. If you do not call for a ceasefire now, we will make our voices heard more and more. In November, we remember. In November, we remember. Nehadawad, uh, head of CARE, said he was speaking in his own capacity. We are joined now by Jim Zogby, president of the Arab American Institute, joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, it's great to have you with us. And if you can talk about these figures that I'm sure the White House is looking at carefully. In 2020, um, President Biden had something like 59 support of the Arab American community. Right now, it's at something like 17 percent. James Zogby, if you can talk about Biden's stance right now on Israel and Gaza. Thanks, Amy. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been together, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Um, look, the, yeah, the poll is one that we did um, to get a read on the community. Um, I have never seen in the 27 years we've been polling, my brother and I have been polling Arab Americans, we never saw a, a, a movement this dramatic over this short a period of time. The last time we polled uh, Arab Americans was just a few months ago, and the drop since then has been even more precipitous than the drop since 2020. Uh, this issue resonates. It's big. Uh, it's important. It also is part of a general national trend. Um, Arab Americans are not immune from the, what the rest of the culture is feeling, is, and that is that President Biden just is not in control of uh, his own presidency and how he is uh, being portrayed uh, to the American people and to the world. They didn't elect a Reaganite 
um, foreign policy uh, advocate, a, a neocon who was fighting for freedom there to have freedom here, that kind of rhetoric that comes from the White House. They voted for somebody to focus on a whole bunch of domestic issues to bring uh, domestic peace and tranquility after four years of Donald Trump. And that's not what they've gotten. And I, I, I think that coupled with the Gaza situation most certainly is driving these negative, these negative numbers. They are deeply disappointed with the position he's taken on this this conflict, and uh, and they they just uh, are are jumping ship. And Jim Zogby, could you talk about the, um, uh, the some other aspects of the poll, uh, uh, what the support for a ceasefire was, and also whether there were uh, gender or age or, or religious differences in in those you polled. What was really significant was that uh, across the board, when you get numbers that high, uh, a flip that high or or numbers in the 70 percent range on several questions like support for a ceasefire or how important is the Palestinian issue to you or how disappointed are you with the president's performance on this issue? All of those numbers were two thirds or greater. When you get numbers that great, you expect across the board to see the crosstabs reading that way. And, and we did. Uh, there was virtually uh, no difference in terms of majorities, um, regardless of religion, regardless of uh, of um, whether born here or immigrant um, or a gender or age. Um, it, pretty much across the board, there's frustration and deep disappointment with this with this president. And um, uh, and and the question I keep getting asked is, uh, can can Biden win him back? Uh, the visceral reaction to this issue is so great that in order to do that, something dramatic has to come from the White House. And I'm not sure that the president has the wherewithal to do it. Look, I've heard two things from people at the White House. The one is uh, they're not going to vote for, for for Donald Trump because they don't want uh, you know they don't want back what he was doing uh, during his four years, and so they'll come around in a year. I, I told them that. When I heard that, I said, that's insulting and dismissive. Um, uh, you have to earn that vote. They might just as well stay home. Uh, they might vote for for uh, Cornell West. They might they might just not vote at all. Uh, and and it's not a given that young Arab American women who want control over their bodies and their health care, that young or that older Arab Americans who want protection for their their you know Medicare or an expansion of health care, it's not clear that they're going to make the decision to vote at all if they don't have something to vote for. It worked the last time, vote for me because I'm not the other guy. I'm not quite sure it'll work, it'll work this time. And you know, I, I've got a an article coming out in the nation tomorrow that makes the point that it's not just Arab Americans who are affected this way. It's young people, it's progressive Jews, um, it's black, Latino, Asian voters. There's a significant decline that this president is encountering across the board. And, and you know, Gaza is playing into it. It is a, a sort of a canary in the coal mine issue. It's, a, uh, it's one that sort of is the the speaking to a broader sense of dissatisfaction and the white house has to get a handle on that and not not just dismiss it and speaking of broader sense of dissatisfaction you worked with bernie sanders for two of his campaigns uh, how do you understand his insistence only on calling for a humanitarian pause and not a ceasefire. And Juan, let me play a clip of Bernie Sanders, uh, who was interviewed this weekend um, on CNN. I want to just clarify one thing, Senator, if I might. You support a humanitarian pause in Gaza. Some of your fellow progressives say that there should be a full-on ceasefire, which would require an agreement on both sides to halt the fighting. Do you support a ceasefire? And if not, why not? Well, I don't know how you can have a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, with an organization like Hamas, which is dedicated to turmoil and chaos and destroying the state of Israel. And I think what the Arab countries in the region understand, that Hamas has got to go. That was Bernie Sanders being interviewed by Dana Bash of CNN. Um, in fact, just a few days ago, uh, Bernie Sanders' office was occupied by a, uh, by a group of progressives uh, protesting that he wasn't calling for a ceasefire, among other senators. Jim Zogby. Look, you know, I, 
I have no idea. I've, I've, I've called the Senator, uh, didn't get a call back, left them a couple of messages, text messages, didn't, didn't hear back. Um, and I'm disappointed and, and fr frankly confounded. I, I don't understand uh, the thinking here. Uh, one could easily take the sentence that he spoke about. You don't have a ceasefire with a group like Hamas that blah, 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 and stick in the Netanyahu government uh, of the most extreme rightists uh, in the country uh, that are today, while under the cover of Gaza, uh, uh, taking uh, armed settlers uh, to evacuate Palestinian villages and force people uh, to leave their lands, leave their their uh, their their orchards and uh, uh, and their homes. Um, this is a crazy extremist government, and and yes, Hamas is uh, is a group that has done and does evil things, just like the Netanyahu government does evil things. The question is, that's why you need a ceasefire. Um, and to say we can't have peace with them, it's what the Palestinians say, we can't have peace with, with the Netanyahu government. But the problem is that the, the United States has to act like the adult in the room, and we haven't. We've been the cheerleader, the coat holder, the enabler, and the funder of one side, uh, digging the hole deeper every single day. And the result is, is that we're locked in a conflict here on Israel's side that has no good end in sight. Um, those who think on this path will eliminate Hamas, forget what happened in Beirut in 82, forget what happened in Lebanon in 2006 or what happened in Afghanistan or Iraq. You don't eliminate. What you do is you create the conditions for something more virulent afterwards. You're not going to get rid of Hamas. I mean, the, the, the million plus people who've been forced to leave their belongings, their memories, the neighborhoods that they lived in now reduced to rubble and flee to the south where there's no infrastructure to take care of them. The families of the 10 thousand who've died, 4,000 of whom children, they're not going to say when this is over, if it's ever over, oh, we love Israel, let's have peace. There is going to be the seed, there are the seeds being planted today um, for Hamas 2.0 or something more virulent. And and I don't understand how the the folks in the White House or the State Department just don't get it and say, this is not going to end well. At the end of this path, with the exception of more dead bodies, more anger, and more virulent extremism, we're going to be right back where we started. Uh, it's a failure of the United States, not of Hamas and, and of Israel, but the United States. We have not shown the leadership um, that we ought to be showing, given the fact that we're funding this damn thing, uh, to stop it. And James Ogbe, you've been for decades now an expert in uh, in public opinion and polling, and it's not just uh, the United States or uh, or England and France where we're seeing unprecedented uh, demonstrations in support of the uh, the Palestinians and uh, opposed to Israeli bombardment and, and the invasion, but also across the global South, you, uh, in in the rest of the world, uh, outside of the Western countries. There's virtually uh, no support uh, for the United States uh, uh, policies and, and Israel. I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, and we've just finished a poll in 12 Arab countries. I should add, my brother does the domestic polling. Uh, we played the game of risk, and, and he took one side of the board, and I got the other side of the board. I do polling in the Middle East and, and some polling in Europe. Uh, we've done some polling on Ukraine and with European countries, uh, their attitude toward it. But in the Arab world, um, uh, we... We've blown it. Uh, there wasn't actually much of a bounce when Joe Biden got elected. The damage done by George W. Bush, um, the disappointment in Obama making promises in Cairo that excited people and then blaming the Arabs for not delivering on the promises he made, um, and then Trump and the, the, the chaos of four years. Uh, people have told me there, uh, we've been on a roller coaster with your country for the last 20 years, and frankly, we're dizzy right now. We don't know what we're getting. Um, they, they too hoped for calm when Joe Biden got elected. And instead of calm, they have two big wars, uh, and they're being forced to choose. And frankly, they can't because they have decided, uh, as European countries are deciding, um, that they have to make their own decisions, and they have to do what's in their interest. And their people are watching what is happening in Gaza and saying, hell no, we're not going to do this anymore. Even countries that have made peace with Israel, uh, their public opinion has turned decidedly against uh, Israel. 
and decidedly against uh, the prospect of living in harmony with that country. Damage has been done here. And I don't understand in all of my conversations with people at the White House and the State Department that they don't just get it. I, I don't I don't know what they're taking in the morning that makes them think today is going to be a better day. Israel's going to kill more people and ever, Arabs are going to say, let's have peace with Israel. That It doesn't work that way. And I, I've been down this road now for the last 40, 50 years doing this work full time. And frankly, it gets worse, not better. And those who think you you win a victory in a war where you kill lots of civilians, um, their heads aren't screwed on right. And frankly, um, we, we need new thinking on this. But the guys in the White House uh, aren't capable, I think, of that kind of new thinking. And it's really it's deeply disturbing because the hole we're digging is one it's going to take a generation to get out of. Jim Zogby, I wanted to ask you a few quick questions. I see you have a TV behind you, and I was looking to see if there was a crack in the screen, uh, because I was wondering if your, co your comments on the coverage by the mainstream media, a word you almost never hear. And I'm not talking about Fox. I'm talking about MSNBC and CNN, places where you appear. Um, rarely do we hear the word occupation mm -hmm. and why that is so significant in understanding how to end this. We're not just talking about Gaza. We're talking about the West Bank. Um, when you had the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, saying uh, right before October 7th, you know, it's peaceful there in the Middle East. We're moving on to other issues. Yet at that time, you had at least a Palestinian a day being killed in the West Bank by settlers or by the Israeli military. Now, I think since October 7th, the number is well over 150. Um, the OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Gaza and the West Bank. Um, question how we should be talking about this issue, what you think would be the most honest. And do you think there's a difference between Biden and Trump, not on other domestic issues, but on Israel-Palestine? Bill Biden promised us a lot. Uh, he issued not just a platform plank the, the, that was one that they made some accommodations uh, to us about, but uh, they issued a separate policy statement for Arab Americans. And um, and I remember when we wanted language that talked about the equality of, of human needs and rights, and they issued that statement uh, that both Israelis and Palestinians are equally deserving of, and then there were a litany of words that followed it. Uh, three, three and a half years later, we're still waiting for the delivery on the equal promise of. Uh, all the Palestinians have gotten has been a green light for Israel to run roughshod over the West Bank, uh, take more land, build more settlements, demolish more homes, more restrictions on Palestinian rights, uh, Jerusalem the same, and Gaza worse. Um, it's been a huge disappointment. And um, uh, and frankly, I, I don't... Um, I, I recall some interesting things in the platform debate that I, that still troubled me because I remember back in 88 when I was negotiating with, with Madeleine Albright uh, on the, the Dukakis-Jackson platform issue, we wanted the word Palestinian in the platform. And the, uh, she told me, she said, if the P word even appears um, in print uh, in the Democratic Party platform, all hell will break loose. I told her, I said, don't play chicken little with me. The sky's not going to fall. We can do it and get it and, and, and live with it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not rocket science to say there are Palestinians in this conflict. The party had never even mentioned the word up till then, and it didn't that year either. Um, what troubled me in 2016 and 2020 um, was that we couldn't get the word occupation in the platform. They wouldn't use the word occupation, which was Trump language. Trump wouldn't use occupation either. In fact, they changed the human rights report from reporting on the occupied territories to putting it all in one in one thing. That was uh, uh, that was the the, the green uh, the what do you call it the uh, U.S. ambassador Friedman uh, Trump's ambassador wanted it that way. There was no occupation. The Biden administration deals with it as if it were an occupation. Uh, in in language, but not in practice, not in practice. We have not put conditions or terms on Israel to deal with Palestinians as an occupied people. Um, and so um, we've kind of come a ways, but we haven't come anywhere at all. From not using the P word to not using the occupation word, um, frankly, it's a maybe a little a bit of a semantic thing, but Palestinians are living under a brutal occupation. It's an apartheid occupation. Um, and they are also being victims of 
a genocidal attack on Gaza right now that is killing the infrastructure, killing the people, forcibly evicting over a million people from their homes in the north to move south, where there is no capacity to care for them. They're living in tents without water, without power, without health care. The hospitals in the south are not capable of dealing with all the issues. Um, and the Israelis are treating the people in the north as if, as the general says, they're all animals and deserve to die. Um, if that's not genocide, I don't know what is. And yet this administration, if they can't use the word occupation, and for God's sake, they won't use the word apartheid, they can't use the word genocide. Something horrible is happening to these people. And this administration is turning a blind eye to it. And I'm sorry, but when they say we're deeply concerned, if that's the best they can do, when we're providing 14.3 billion additional this year on top of 4 billion, when we're providing diplomatic cover at the United Nations, that is not enough. And frankly, this, what is happening in Gaza is not only happening on our watch, but we're complicit and enabling it. Sounds harsh, but it's the reality and they have to deal with it. And there are gonna be electoral consequences. And I, I wish it weren't so. Last thing on earth I wanna see is a Republican of the type of Donald Trump or whoever comes after in the White House. But they have to earn the vote and establish that there's a difference. They haven't done it. James Zogby, president of the Arab American Institute, joining us from Washington, D.C. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give. The closing thoughts that I want to give to this is that I'm 39. I just recently turned 39 years old. I've been protesting and agitating and educating since 2009 on this very subject only for new you know people who are new to the to the scene who come up and say yeah man we're really radical and stuff to tell me how to how better to do what i do um even though i've never claimed to be at the head of any of this stuff um i guess it's because i've been effective at reaching people um the real the real effectiveness started i think in 2018 because it, then it was realized there's no joke to this it may surprise people to know that the Jewish Iranians love being in Iran and they don't support Israel. The most aggressive anti-Zionist population of, yes, population of people who oppose the existence of the state of Israel are Jewish. It was us Jewish people who opposed it originally after the Holocaust. A lot of pro propaganda backed by the Western capitalists and, the, and you know, Bolshevik Soviet communists in favor of Israel took off. And, and again, no, I'm not bashing Stalin or saying Stalin was this great murderer. I mean, you know, that's one of the ways to tell when someone's anti-Semitic is if they think that Stalin is worse than Hitler. That usually gives it away. And, and Stalin actually did have a soft spot for the Yiddish language. It might surprise you to know that. Uh, but his uh, – the, the apparent rationale – and every Marxist-Leninist has told me this. The apparent rationale that he had for supporting the state of Israel was so the British would no longer be in control. That's the worst reasoning in the world because the British were not the British were bad, but the Zionists are worse, and here's why. And they were always worse. In the Balfour Declaration, an Arab state is acknowledged right next to a Jewish state. Never mind the fact that the concept of a Jewish state is an oxymoron, but the the Zionists have never accepted Palestine. They never will. The Nakba was done by labor Zionists. Yes, they're so-called left-wing Zionists. All Zionism, whether right-wing, center, or left-wing, is all far-right. It's all far-right. It's just different ways of doing it. I've been to Iran four times, and it's hard to be around a lot of Americans, just Americans who think they know what they're talking about. Americans should lose the American culture. Whatever your culture was before becoming American, one should try to investigate that. Americans are the new Romans, and Romans are all about themselves. Oh, the poor soldiers that invaded these countries, and we feel so bad for them. But, you know, there's no humanity even given to, you know, the fact that Iran is a force of stability within the region. 
And even if you don't like a lot of what Iran is doing, Iran has been behind a lot of the real humanitarian projects over there. You think the United States has ever been behind any of that? No. Anyway, this came out November 8th, recently, November 8th in 2023. Uh, this is Jason under the mouse triple, you know, giving an update on the current situation we find ourselves in, in, in this nightmare that is this century. It is becoming increasingly clear that the United States is looking for a justification for starting a war with Iran. Already, they have created as much, alleging that United States troops have been injured or even killed by Iranian-backed forces in Syria and inside of Iraq. Unfortunately, the proof of any of these accusations has not yet really been forthcoming. At least 45 Americans are reporting minor injuries or potential traumatic brain injuries. U.S. defense officials claim that the injuries were caused by groups with links to Iran. In the past, 21 service members were allegedly sustained minor injuries from attacks on U.S. forces at Al-Tanf in southern Syria and on Al-Ast Air Base in western Iraq late last month. Even if we assume these accusations to be accurate, there is one important question that's being left out of this. Why is the United States in both of those countries? Why is the United States inside of Syria? The Syrian government at no point gave the United States any permission to place troops inside of their country. These U.S. troops, which definitely are inside of Syria right now, are illegally occupying the country. But this particular context is not being mentioned by, frankly, any of the U.S. aligned media in the world. This very important piece of context is very deliberately being left out. Interestingly, the U.S. blames the recent attacks on Iranian-backed militia groups. While they have not said Iran is directing the attacks, U.S. officials say Iran is responsible for funding, arming, equipping, and training the groups. Representatives Ruben Gallo, the Democrat from Arizona, Morgan Luttrell, Republican from Texas, Bill Johnson, Republican from Ohio, wrote a letter to Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin asking how the Pentagon is protecting the troops. The department must proactively work to reduce the risk to service members, both to protect our men and women in uniform and to preserve the capability and readiness of forward operating bases. According to NBC News, there have been multiple attacks on U.S. troops in both countries. Since October 17, there have been at least 38 separate attacks on bases housing U.S. troops in Syria and Iraq, mainly by one-way drones, mortars, or rockets. The two attacks that caused the injuries were both on October 18. In retaliation, the U.S. has killed several alleged Iran-linked forces. Once again, we ask the same question. What is the United States doing inside of Syria? They were never invited by the Syrian government to be there. By contrast, Iran, which does have some forces inside of the country, were invited there by the actual President Bashar al-Assad in order to help carry out anti-ISIS operations. So they are there legally, while the United States is not. So the United States is essentially trespassing on Syrian property and then killing people who are inf invited guests of the Syrian government. But all of this context is very deliberately being left out. All that is rep being reported by the media, all that is being talked about by U.S. politicians is that U.S. troops are being attacked and thus we then have to defend them. The attempt at justifying war this time around, at least with Iran, is by building sympathy towards U.S. troops that have been killed or even injured by these attacks, by saying the poor troops who are trespassing in somebody else's country, the U.S. is using sympathy towards those soldiers, which is very high domestically at home, in order to justify military conflict with Iran. To make matters worse, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony J. Blinken has falsely claimed that Iran is attempting to cause the Israel-Palestine conflict to spread out into surrounding countries, an accusation that has no evidence whatsoever. On Sunday, he announced that nuclear-powered submarine was traveling through the region. The U.S. makes another complaint. Heading off any escalation by Iran or its proxies in the region is a priority for U.S. officials. 
the roughly 3,500 U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria have already been subjected to more than 40 drone attacks and rocket attacks by Iran-aligned militias since Hamas invaded southern Israel on October 7. And a wider regional conflict would likely draw American forces deeper into the fight. The United States citing retaliation for the rocket and drone attacks against U.S. forces carried out two airstrikes last week on sites in eastern Syria that it said were being used by Iran and its proxies. Again, the U.S. is illegally occupying a country. Iraq has already told them to leave. The U.S. explicitly refused to leave the country and continues to carry out the illegal occupation of the country to this day. Meanwhile, allied Arab states like Jordan and Egypt have pleaded with the United States to step in and attempt to rein in Israel to some degree to try to scale back Israel's ongoing genocide against the Palestinian people. However, the United States has done no such thing. Instead, they have gone ahead and actually hindered efforts to get aid relief to Gazans and have consistently gone out and covered up even whitewashed war crimes committed by the Israeli military. This comes as the Israeli regime has intensified its bombardment campaign against Gaza since October 7, after the Palestinian resistance movement Hamas launched its Operation Al-Aqsa Storm in response to decades of violence against Palestinians. Palestinian officials in the besieged Gaza Strip say that the Israeli regime has dropped more than 20,000 tons of explosives on the territory in its ongoing war of aggression. The Palestinian Health Ministry in Gaza announced on Monday that the death toll from the incessant Israeli bombardment of the coastal territory stood at 10,022, including 4,104 children and 2,641 women. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.